to change a person. And those changes run deeper than just being more fit, more disciplined, or knowing how to shoot a rifle. Time in the service, especially time served in combat, is bound to change a person to their very core. It was the summer between my junior and senior year of high school, and I was looking for a way to pay for college and for how I was going to build those life experiences on my resume. During the process, as I dug through all the options, I landed in a recruiter's office. And after meeting with nearly every recruiter in Bozeman, on July 27, 2001, I raised my right hand, I took my oath, and I enlisted into the Montana Army National Guard. Less than two months later, our nation came under attack on September 11th. I knew everything for me had just changed, but I didn't really know anything more than that. It was the first few days of my senior year of high school, so I knew I was safe from an immediate deployment. I finished high school. Immediately after graduation, I shipped out for basic training in my military police schools. After all my schools were done, I came back to Bozeman, and despite a war raging in Afghanistan, everything went according to plan for me. I started college at MSU, and I attended my drill weekends once a month. Then, in March of 2003, I got the phone call. My unit was being deployed. We didn't know where we were going or how long we'd be gone, but we knew we were leaving Montana in less than 10 days. After two months of training and speculation, we finally left the United States for Kuwait, and ultimately we landed in Baghdad, Iraq. While we served in Baghdad, our part was in an overarching mission to rebuild the Baghdad Police Department that had been destroyed and dismantled during the initial invasion. My job within that, personally, was to work as a security gunner on a Humvee truck. I was the eyes and ears of our convoy. It was my job to make sure that whoever I was with got safely to where they needed to be. Primarily, I worked on the commander's escort team, making sure he got to all of his meetings. By the end of my tour, I was awarded the Army Commendation Medal and sided with over 300 convoys without major incidents. Despite such an awesome track record, it only took one convoy on April 13, 2004, to change that. On that day, we were wrapping up a normal day of running around town, running to meetings, escorting equipment through town. We were headed back to camp for dinner when our convoy was hit with an improvised explosive device, or IED. In that blast, I was left with a separated shoulder. I crushed all the nerves down my left arm. I'd later be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, PTSD, and I'd also be diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury, which greatly impacts my memory and my ability to gracefully regulate emotions, as you've seen. More than once in the nine years since I've been home, I've been called a hero. And I have to admit that I absolutely hate it every time. I joined the military to serve my needs, to pay for college and to build a resume. And when I was asked to do more, I did, and I was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time when that IED detonated. Don't get me wrong, I loved my job. I loved being a turret gunner overseas. And on the state side, I got to train seven different weapon systems, and I got to teach other soldiers how to move safely and effectively in a combat environment. There are two reasons that I hate the hero notion. The first reason is that while I'm proud of my service, I feel that the military as a whole is a very unhealthy culture, and that we're just starting to see the tip of it. The military I served in was still very much a good old boys club. They turned a blind eye to hazing and harassment. There was the cover-up of sexual assaults and rapes, distorted numbers about PTSD and suicide. They did whatever it took to make sure that we stayed looking shiny and polished from the outside. But inside, it was a warped and unhealthy lifestyle. A few months after I joined the military, long before we even deployed, I was sexually assaulted by one of my non-commissioned officers. I didn't report it at the time because I was in shame and embarrassed by what had happened. And because I was still so new to the military, I was intimidated by my chain of command. Two years later, when I finally did come forward and report, um, did come forward and press charges against him on behalf of myself and several other women, I was blamed for ruining his career. I dealt with harassment on a regular basis throughout the six years I was in the service. Male soldiers and NCOs that I worked with went out of their way to tarnish my reputation and make other soldiers question my ability to do my job. 
When we got to Iraq, I asked to be a gunner, and I was told no. When I asked why not, I was told simply that females aren't gunners. I had to go out of my way to prove that I was not only capable, but actually better qualified to do a job that it was assumed only my male counterparts could do. I was passed over for promotion by men with less time in the service and less qualifications than myself. And when I got wounded, I sustained all concussive injuries, so there was no blood. And I was told by several men in my company that it was all psychological, and I just needed to suck it up and get over it. The second reason that I hate the hero notion is that there's a lot of things that happened in Iraq that certainly don't make me feel like a hero. There's a part of me that was left there, and it impacts how I look at the world to this very day. The most drastic of these moments was a typical hot summer day in the middle of September. We'd been in Iraq for a few months, and we dealt with our share of mortar attacks, but nothing up close and personal. We were loading our trucks and getting ready to roll out for another day's work, when we got the word that one of our squads had just been hit with an IED. We scrambled to load the last of our gear, dashed out to the site because it wasn't far from where we were living. We set up a security perimeter so that the damaged trucks could be safely loaded and removed from the area. We were given word that two soldiers had been medevaced from the scene already, but we didn't know who or what their condition was. Part of my job while we were on the security perimeter was to listen to the radio traffic. As I listened to the chatter, a call came through for the commander and the chaplain to get to the hospital immediately. My heart stopped. In that moment, in the middle of that desert, thousands of miles from home, I was afraid that my friends were dying. In that moment, I flipped my weapon to fire and I looked at all the Iraqis surrounding our security perimeter, smiling and waving at us and shouting how much they loved America, and I just wanted to open fire. I wanted them to feel the pain and fear that I felt in that very moment. And that feeling of revenge, that feeling of wanting to take another human life, still haunts me to this day. Later in the day, we did receive word that despite sustaining critical injuries, both of our friends would live. On New Year's morning, 2004, there was a loud crash outside the front of our, our compound. I grabbed my rifle and I ran to see what the noise was about. A car had crashed into a concrete security barrier. I ran to the car. Both occupants had died on impact. Both were special forces soldiers in the British Army. And they were killed in a simple car accident in the middle of a combat zone. The list goes on and on. A friend of mine was left with permanent injuries after he was accidentally run over by a Humvee. A young female from our battalion was killed in an ambush late at night. Another soldier from our company took a piece of shrapnel through his face when our chow hall was mortared during breakfast. So what's the point in me telling you all of this? It's not for your sympathy. It's because I want you to understand that these are the burdens that I brought home with me. These are the things that I have to reconcile with my brain and my belief system. I was told, I was told my whole life that do good unto others and that thou shalt not kill. And yet I had thoughts of killing people. I knew good people who were killed by bad people. I had to understand why such amazing, talented, caring young, young individuals were being killed and maimed in a war that nobody seemed to fully support. I had to believe that somehow I was right and the Iraqis were wrong. That somehow my life was more valuable than theirs. And that never sat right with me. I invaded their country. I rolled through their streets with guns drawn. But because my government was deemed superior, I was justified. I struggled to find comfort from the mental torment and relief from the physical pains that I had. I felt crazy when I had to ask for the medical care that I needed, or when I didn't get the medals that I knew I deserved. By the time I got out of the service, I wondered if it had all been worth it. After six years in the military, I felt that every inch of my body and psyche was trashed. Shortly after getting out of the military, I hated pretty much everything about myself. My life spun out of control. I flunked out of college. 
I got fired from my job. I isolated myself in depression and anxiety, and I ultimately ruined the relationship with all of my friends and most of my family. I tried to bury it all with various forms of self-medication, but nothing worked. Ultimately, I was just angry and lost and alone. I woke up one morning and I decided I had a choice to make. It was either time to kill myself or it was time to change everything. I called the VA and I asked for help. I committed to going to therapy twice a week, once individually, once in a group session. I committed to a regimen of medications to help manage the crippling depression, anxiety, and insomnia. I started physical therapy and ultimately had to have shoulder surgery to try to minimize some of the physical pains that I lived with. I also walked away from my faith, from everything that I grew up believing, and I came to the conclusion that I believe, simply believe that this world is a chaotic place, and we've got one chance to enjoy it. While this change in belief didn't relieve all my pain, it did help ease the burden of trying to understand and justify everything that had happened in Iraq. It led me to believe that the life is about a journey of what's happening here and now, and that led me to want to pursue a career in helping others. I realized that the only person that could right the wrongs that had happened to me was me. I spent two years fighting the VA to get them to acknowledge and diagnose my traumatic brain injury. I spent five years fighting the Department of the Army to finally be awarded the Purple Heart Medal for the wounds I was received on April 13, 2004 in that IED. I still go to counseling and physical therapy, trying to put things right with my mind and body. And I speak with the media as often as I can about my story in hopes that I can help another lost soldier or I can help another civilian understand just a little bit more about life after war. When I was writing this speech, I realized I'm incredibly <laughs> hesitant to share these experiences with the dark side of the military and my belief that I think the military is incredibly unhealthy. Because I'm afraid people are going to misconstrue my words as being unpatriotic or ungrateful of the benefits that I have and continue to receive. But that's not the case. I think, it's, I think it, everybody deserves to know both the good and the bad about our military. And that we can't fix the problems if we don't know the details. We'll never stop sexual assault and rapes in the military if we don't talk about the current lack of punishment. We will never end veteran and soldier suicide if we don't talk about how the military inadvertently punishes anyone who admits to having pain or needing help. Or how society puts more pressure on the veteran's shoulders by expecting us to be perfect proud heroes or violent, vagrant, PTSD-ridden bums. Serving in, the com serving in combat changes a person, and those changes run deep. Most of those on today's front lines are just kids. 18, 19 years old, some of the most impactful years of their lives, and it's all being shaped by the culture of military and combat. If we're ever going to change the rates of sexual assault, PTSD, or suicide, it starts with the whole world knowing the truth. It starts with us having a conversation today about what's going on, and it starts with us taking to our military leadership and holding them accountable for the decisions that they're making. But more importantly, we need to learn to support and respect and meet each veteran where they're at. Some veterans don't like talking about their story. Some veterans can't talk about it enough. Every veteran I've ever worked with simply felt they were doing their job. No more, no less. And I don't think I've ever met a veteran who felt they deserved to be called a hero. We all have different paths in lives, military or civilian. But we also like to create stereotypes as a society so that we can, play, can, we can explain things in a clean and orderly fashion. We've heard it throughout history. Veterans have been lumped as heroes or baby killers. We believe they're all Christian because we've been told so many times that there are no atheists in the boxes. But I want to tell you, it's just, it's just not that simple. It's our tendency to fall back on these stereotypes that makes it so difficult for the veteran to cope with their own story for them to know where to ask for help, or how to even ask for help. But if we could meet each other with unconditional support and respect, but, and not with preconceived ideas, it would help our veterans to feel not so isolated and not so alone in their community. So please, as you leave here today, I ask you to remember, 
to just ask me my story. Don't label me with your ideas. I'm not a hero. I'm simply a veteran of the United States Army. Thank you.